morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to another edition of Very Educational Lectures for You. The first speaker for today is our honorable guest from China, Professor Ding Jiangping. He is a Vice President, Department of Neurosurgery, Tangdu Hospital, Air Force Medical University. He is a hybrid neurosurgeon and well known for his interventional skills in the management of ischemia and hemorrhagic cerebral vascular diseases. We are extremely honored to have him today as our speaker at our webinar, and he will be talking about treatment strategy of colossal AVM in a hybrid platform. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from United States of America, Professor Isaac Young. Professor Young is a consultant neurosurgeon specializing in the surgical treatment and clinical outcome of adult brain and spinal cord tumor at the University of California, Los Angeles. His clinical expertise focuses in the management of a brain tumor with special emphasis in skull-based tumor and vestibular schwannoma. He is the recipient of several national awards and grants to honor his research work in brain tumor and excellent in treating and caring for patients. He is also the principal investigator at the UCLA Brain Tumor Program. We are extremely happy to have him today with us and he will be talking about modern advances in surgery and radio surgery in the management of vestibular schwannoma. The chair for the first session today webinar is our distinguished guest from China, Professor Bingzu. Professor Bingzu is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Fasan Hospital, Fudan University, China. He is an expert cerebral vascular surgeon with largest number of bypasses for Moya Moya disease in the world. His contribution to the education of young neurosurgeons is unparalleled. We are extremely thankful to him for his unrelenting support for us in, the education, in these educational ventures by giving us access to the world-class speaker and airing this webinar on the WeChat channel in China. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Japan, Professor Michihiro Kono. Professor Kono is the chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, at Tokyo Medical University, Tokyo, Japan. Professor Kono reserved his specialties in skull-based and CP angle tumor and holds record of the highest number of operated cases of vestibular schwannoma. He is an integral part of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and has been academically active in various online educational programs. We are extremely thankful to Professor Kono for accepting our invitation to chair the second lecture of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President Professor Yokokato, I would like to welcome both chairs, speakers, and all audiences to this online platform of SNS webinar. A warm welcome again to our colleague in China uh, via WeChat channel, and we are extremely uh, thankful to Professor Bingzu for broadcasting this webinar in the WeChat channel. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our first chair, Professor Bingzu. Okay, thank you, Dr. Liu. So now uh, there are already uh, more than 550 audience are waiting for, the, for this webinar. The first speaker is Professor Deng Jinping. He is uh, very famous in West part of the China. And uh, he is an assistant professor of uh, uh, Tangdu, a, a very big uh, neurosurgical department. Uh, let's give the time to him. OK, Professor Deng Jinping. Uh, good, good evening. Uh, I'm very happy to have this chance to discuss uh, treatment on cerebral AVM. I have little time to, to make a presentation in English, so I try my best to express myself uh, well. I emphasize uh, the hybrid platform, not uh, hybrid uh, uh, surgery. For under the uh, hybrid platform, a lot of cases not treated with uh, hybrid uh, surgery. But on the collection of hybrid uh, platform, uh, even for the cases treated uh, uh, with pure embolization, uh, have a good result. Uh, as we all know, hybrid platform is not new for the uh, it's not new, but for the neurosurgery, I want it's new. Uh, only recent uh, ten years in China, the uh, the hybrid platform was introduced to our field. But uh, hybrid surgery didn't uh, create any new technique. They just uh, integrate uh, 
in the vascular modality and uh, surgical modality with the same platform uh, within certain duration. Uh, this uh, platform overcome shortcoming of each technique create uh, uh, effect uh, one plus one or the two. So uh, some cases, some layers, uh, it, it's difficult to treat it uh, by only in the vascular uh, modality or surgical modality, but we can treat it uh, with the combination of these two techniques. Um, also, for some complex cases, we can make a private treatment strategy. Uh, we can have different patterns of combination as needed to treat it uh, with the best uh, outcome and uh, outcome and uh, uh, safety. Uh, in China, we always from from twelve years ago, I always said that. Uh, Hybrid surgery is the future of treatment of, on cerebral AVMs, especially for the unruptured uh, brain AVMs. For now, it's a, it's a, it's a controversy to also to treat whether or not whether or not to treat the unruptured cerebral AVMs. For it's a high uh, com high complication rate and not a good uh, uh, angiography of other camps. Uh, uh, in 2016, in 2016, our center introduced the hybrid hybrid suit. From that time, we treated the we we, we treat uh, AVM. The target of treatment of AVM has changed. Uh, for most of the time, also of the cases, cure was the other target of treatment. Also, we all want to uh, also want to have good uh, safety. Uh, What's the safety? The definition is the no related permanent deficiency and dies. We all know colossal uh, AVM is a rare lesions. Only 4% of the older AVMs usually classified as the uh, periventricular AVM. We, we all know uh, the AVM uh, located on the roof of the ventricular. Usually, to supply uh, feeders from the uh, anterior cerebral artery, especially the anterior part and the body of the colosseum of a colosseum. Sometimes the lenti lenticular artery also supplying the AVMs. For the posterior of the body, for the posterior of the colosseum, the features may come from the ACA, also come from the PCA, such as the posterior peri uh, pericolosseum artery. Sometimes the posterior cryo artery also uh, supplying the uh, AVMs. The next classical uh, colosseum uh, AVMs uh, were located entirely inside the corpus colosseum, but sometimes it can uh, extend to neighbor uh, such a structure. Uh, for sometimes uh, uh, inferior to the inside the inside the ventricular, also can separate to the neighbor drivers. Usually it involved the deep pool, the deep pool wings draining. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, universal uh, uh, exclusively uh, deep draining also sometimes can drill up, up uh, drip superior to the uh, SSS. This uh, is the, this picture, uh, this picture just uh, uh, Media seen from the from the media side to see the uh, colossal colossal AVMs. He can uh, the the region can located any any part of the colosseum, but it's also sometimes located from the anterior to the uh, posterior part. All the uh, colosseum of the world. Uh, from the 26, 26, oh, sorry, twenty sixth twenty sixth uh, January to to now. Well, we all have uh, 21 cases of colosseum with col col colosseum AVMs. The presentation of this group of patients uh, was hemorrhage for 20 cases. Only one, ca only one case was an rupture. She accompanied uh, with a ruptured posterior uh, communicating uh, uh, aneurysm. 
for the uh, spatula and magic grading, we can see that uh, most of the cases were, were high uh, grading, grading three to four. Only three was low graded uh, layers. Uh, for the uh, angel, angel, angiographic outcome, uh, uh, 18, pieces, 18 patients was cured uh, totally with uh, the layers were totally removed. And the partial uh, was part embolization for one patient for the enrupture. This is the enrupture areas. Uh, four patients were died. One patient died from the uh, malignant hypersemia. Hyper it's a uh, massive complications. Uh, it's difficult to, in China, we have the special cure drug. So, in China, the death rate is uh, more than 70%. Uh, unfortunately, we met uh, one of these cases. Uh, the second death is from that from a certain ribbon. Later, I will show the case for us, uh, for, for everybody. Uh, also, we have five patterns of different combination. Uh, combination. First one, first one, first uh, fake uh, six cases. We just uh, embolize it uh, from the type protection operation. So this is a cure uh, embolization. The second is was totally resected uh, under the uh, under intra surgery uh, under operation DSA. Uh, the second kind of the true hybrid. Uh, some cases was pre risk surgical embolization. Or some cases uh, was introduced intra procedure embolization. Uh, also, we have a uh, 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 second uh, had other two patterns. Uh, partial water resected uh, with uh, residue uh, events. The residue was water uh, embolization embolized. Uh, partial uh, also also we have a case is. Uh, uh, was part of embolized, embolized and with a second total uh, removed with open surgery. Now we can show some uh, the cases. Uh, for the first kind, for the first kind of pattern of compensation is the only embolization. Uh, for in the uh, during the pe this period in our in our center we. All want to cure the patient. So for the uh, for all the all the these cases was prepared for hybrid surgery. But uh, at the be, 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 but uh, during the surgery, when we embolize the embolize, embolize the first uh, with the procedure in uh, progresses, we realized that we can cure it it with um, only embolization. For this case, uh, six cases, uh, most of this case is uh, this kind of cases. Uh, but uh, most of the cases were small uh, layers. I will show you the first one cases. We, we can see from the uh, right and the left uh, ICA, DSA, we can show that the first uh, part of the Colosseum, uh, the AVM, the AVM letters is not more than uh, not be, not, not, not a large more than one millimeter. Uh, he has only one uh, feature, artery feature from the ACA. So we uh, we selected the ACA uh, feeding pander uh, with the marathon with marathon micro cassiard. In our center, we have no detachable uh, micro cassiard. So uh, we played the second. The original bleed on the embolization uh, micro cassette. We place placed some coins just uh, behind the first uh, uh, micro cassette. Then we make a, a modified price price cooker technique. So for only one side of embolization, the the the, the layer was embolized totally. This is the final result of the after the procedure. We can show see that the AVM was disappeared totally. Also, they can they, this is easy case for embolization. Also, 
uh, we have show uh, I have showed the another uh, uh, cases also f uh, the, the the letters are located uh, at a powerful po positive part of the colosseum. Uh, this is a ruptured uh, layers. So uh, we just uh, we just uh, make um, uh, uh, make a decision of uh, target target embolization. Uh, reduce the uh, blood flow and reduce the the chance of uh, rupture ruptured. So we also can see that uh, he also uh, received a uh, blood uh, blood supply from the posterior circulation. Uh, so we only uh, partly uh, update the uh, AVMs. Uh, the others was. Uh, uh, was kept for the SAI surgery. Is there the final result uh, with uh, uh, and uh, sub-digested uh, uh, sub mass? Also, we have another case. Is, uh, this is a really a female with a sudden sack. Uh, so uh, he's, he's learned, she is learned. From the city, we can uh, not too much blood inside the ventricular. This is the MI showed that uh, some uh, uh, a normal, a normal, a normal blood uh, uh, picture inside the uh, ventricular. From the uh, right, uh, I see uh, we can see the AVM also located uh, uh, at the past poster. Uh, spelling spelling also re, uh, from the left uh, uh, SA, so he received a uh, uh, bipolar bi bi bilateral artery uh, uh, ACA supply. Also, we can see that uh, he also received the blood supply from the posterior uh, cerebral artery. So, I will think that the most important thing is to do is to delete. Uh, the post part of the post part of AVMs from the posterior PCA. Uh, maybe this is the uh, this part uh, causing the bleeding. So at first, uh, we select the feeders from the posterior uh, uh, artery. And this is the first uh, uh, super selection. We also do something uh, onicus. This is a second uh, selection. Uh, this is onicus, uh, onyx mice. The third uh, uh, selection, uh, this is the onicus mice. Uh, this is the fourth selection. And the, uh, the first, uh, every time of after uh, when uh, each uh, after each selection super selection we can make a rotation DSA to realize uh, to, to to recognize the uh, red part of the uh, AVM so also uh, recognize the uh, impossible possible possible selection so this is the uh, last uh, selection from the posterior uh, posterior uh, uh, posterior artery. After this time, the, all of the supplying from the posterior cerebral artery was disappeared. So we uh, super select from the anterior, C, anterior cerebral artery, also with uh, modified price PCT techniques. We just uh, uh, inject the onyx with one time. At the, at the last, uh, we can see the, the coy, also the Onyx mice. This is the re renal result from the uh, post uh, ICA, uh, post DSA, also from the posterior uh, vegetable artery DSA. We can see we can see the uh, normal uh, normal blood. Also, we have the, another seven cases uh, only. Receive the open also no surgery. Uh, during the surgery, we can make a different. We can um, we can we, so many times or uh, DSA. Uh, 
in this group of patients, one who died of malignant hyperthermia, he, this young boy died on the operating table. Uh, all other, all other from all, all other cases uh, was good. Uh, the protein was selected uh, interhemispheric vessel uh, protein. Uh, uh, we must pay more attention to protect the uh, brain to wings and uh, also from uh, also the brain. Uh, Lawton told us uh, sometimes we more selected the uh, right uh, side, right side of the brain uh, to, uh, to, to involving a branch of the uh, branch language, language brain. But uh, for, for my opinion, uh, the most the most important is the brain to win. We try to avoid in the, uh, the the side where the more brain uh, brain to wins. Uh, this case is uh, a thirty five years uh, uh, young woman. Uh, tw ten years ago when he when she was 25, 25 years, uh, he experienced uh, a bleeding. Uh, ten years later he. She has another bleeding from uh, this area. We can see that the uh, uh, from the uh, ACA and HADSA, we can see that uh, the the AVM was not uh, so compact. For for the, the reason is he received the SRS, so maybe some some part of the AVM so was silent. We can see it on the DSA, but uh, in fact, he has uh, exist. From the posterior of the uh, part of uh, uh, posterior part of the events, uh, seeing supply from the posterior P PCA, uh, I also think that uh, this part is uh, the uh, bleeding. Is the bleeding why is bleeding? This is uh, the criminal criminal. So we uh, we make a, a hybrid bridge. This is during the branch we can we make a, a DSA. Uh, from um, as the last chapter of the train, uh, we, we made a, a final DSA show that the AVM was completed, complete uh, was completely disappeared. This is the post uh, what you what if we are as a, the patient was get a cure? Uh, there is no any comp, uh, there is no com, any complications. Uh, the second pattern is the true hybrid operation. Uh, in this group of patients, uh, we have six cases. Uh, five was cured. One with partial resection, died of uncertain cause. Uh, when we show this case, uh, most are deceived. Deep seated and the largest uh, layers. Uh, this um, this is a twenty eight young patient. He also suffered from the headache. Alert. There is no any uh, movement movement death function. Uh, from the con C uh, C CT, we can see a little blood, a little hemorrhage inside the uh, ventricular. Uh, from the MI, we can see uh, some flow flow. Or uh, uh, blood and um, some blood vessel uh, image. Uh, only very, very, very little supplying from the left uh, uh, ACA. So most uh, uh, feeders come from the right ACA. We can this is the AP angel. Also from the lateral angel, we can see the. Uh, uh, layers uh, located um, uh, down to the uh, lo located uh, the posterior of the colosseum. Also, some layers was extended into the uh, uh, ventricular. From the part uh, uh, from the post uh, PCA, we can we also can supply from the PCA. So I think uh, if you uh, res uh, resect it uh, resect it from the anterior uh, interhemispheric routine. Uh, the most difficult uh, part of of the lesion is the uh, the the post part of the uh, AVMs uh, elect uh, 
uh, receive a supply in from the posterior. So at uh, the first uh, we see uh, we, we select to embolize, embolize the, the part of the AVM from the PCA. This is the super super selected Andrew uh, DSA. We can so we can see the while well show the AVMs. After only one one second embolization, we can see uh, the vertebral DSA didn't show too much um, AVMs. Uh, the second selection, super selection from the ACA, we can see that the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the anterior part of the AVM was embolized. So after these two session embolization, only part of the only middle part, the central part of the AVM was residued. So at, at that time, we begin to resect it. Uh, this during the surgery. Uh, we make uh, uh, several times of several times DSA. We can see the residue of AVMs. At the last, uh, the AVM was resected totally. Uh, the patient was cured. But at uh, the first case, first uh, five days of post of surgery, the patient can't move his right leg. After five year, uh, five, five days, he uh, recovered totally. There is any complications. Uh, this is the vertebrae, vertebrae angiography. You can see any part, uh, uh, any, uh, any of the AVM. We also from the onyx mice, we can see that the embryo two embolization session is make the surgery easy. For most of the uh, onyx was reused, what was, was exist after the procedure. For, the, for this means that uh, the part of the AVM was uh, embolized AVM is not a, is not needed to resect it. Uh, after the post post surgery CT scan, uh, this is the the, the MRI scan. Uh, also, we have another young girl is five year, uh, nine years uh, nine year ago. Uh, also, body uh, experience the bleeding. From the AVMs, we can see that uh, from the body to the posterior part of the colosseum, uh, the AVM layer was long, uh, more than four, four millimeters. Uh, at the first time, we just um, uh, to uh, to resect to resect it. So we along the anterior cerebral artery, the AVM was uh, uh, coagulated and uh, to remove. At the post part, the most po po posterior part of AVM. During the surgery, we make a, a decision to embolize this part of AVM. So uh, during the surgery, we super select the uh, artery feeders. This is, uh, show, show the res residue, uh, res residue AVMs. So we another uh, we make a, a intra uh, surgery. Uh, embolization, the, the patient uh, was cured. There is no, any complications. The, the, uh, the AVM was disappeared. Also, we have the, the fatal cases. This is a, a certain young woman, certain young woman, he has a long story. Uh, he had one bleeding from, the AVM was founded with a rupture time, but after uh, half a year, the, the, the AVM bleeding. So, the patient uh, suffer from no ventricular infection, and also uh, he can her house also has a hydrocephalus. So, so he she was uh, uh, he was embodied in uh, or more than sister under the scale on, on the scale on the head scale. So we can see a sister a sister during the his uh, brain. Uh, at this time, how to make it? It's uh, a good. Uh, it's it's a dilemma. Uh, for the AVM was uh, rescued. If we select to uh, make a VP 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 shunt, maybe when they treat the AVMs, maybe we will uh, make the VP uh, uh, work. So we select to resect the uh, AVMs. This is the MI MI. Uh, this is the DSA. We can see mm, the AVMs was the posterior part of the colosseum. 
also received the uh, received uh, supply from the posterior. Uh, uh, this uh, we make a, a super selector to ambulance embolize the some part of the AMS. Uh, after the uh, embolization, we resect uh, the rest of the AVM. But uh, at the end of time, we can see uh, a residue, very small residue of AVMs. But uh, we, we, we stopped to resect it. Uh, this is a uh, DSL from the posterior uh, circulation. But after, after the posterior surgery, uh, well, the first day of the surgery, uh, she, she is normal. Uh, we can see there is an anabolity, also the sister is the rest. But uh, after 20, uh, 24 hours, he sudden, he sudden uh, uh, co became coma. Uh, at that time, we think maybe the sister is too high, uh, high pressure. Uh, at that time, he, uh, our doctor to suction the uh, or man, or male, or male sister. Uh, uh, but uh, the the patient the didn't recover, recover. So with the uh, intubation, uh, we make a scan, CT scan, show that uh, the uh, the sister disappeared. Uh, may, maybe this is for the resection, but uh, we can't find. Uh, we didn't find any bleeding. We also didn't find any um, uh, other. Ischemia, so we, we we don't know we don't know what's the real what's the real where it it dies. Uh, this is another supposed the, the the last case is a also the fifteen year old year old girl is studied in USA but uh, he suffered from when he came back to China he uh, suffered from a headache. Also CT we can see a bleeding from the AVMs. Am I or can see the uh, AVM. Uh, from the right uh, ADSA, we can show uh, uh, big uh, AVMs. So this is the left. Uh, we can show that from the uh, rostral of the colosseum. Uh, from the left ICA, uh, we can, from the lateral, uh, anchor we can we can see that the layers is long enough most uh, uh, part of the colosseum was evolved so we think embolization uh, kind of worked for this layer we uh, begin to uh, uh, resect it so uh, uh, we have more than five times of dsa during the surgery uh, from different uh, artery feeders, left and uh, right, 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 right ICA, then left ICA, then post uh, circulation uh, uh, angiogram. At the last, we think we can we totally remove the layers. Uh, this is the uh, final result of uh, final result after the uh, after the procedure. We can see that. There's a very small residue AVM, very, very uh, small AVM residue, but uh, at that time we didn't treat it uh, immediately. After half a year, after half a year, uh, the, the girl re uh, uh, returned to my hospital. Um, we can see the AVM still there, and the uh, fetal artery can change the to normal. So we uh, make another uh, make a, a, a embolization. So the, the patient uh, was cured. Uh, we have make a, a little summary. On the hybrid form, it's physical to cure colostrum even. Uh, for group of our patients, they will have two dyes. But uh, the two dyes, uh, there is nothing, there's nothing related to the surgery or to the embolization or to the hybrid uh, surgery. One for the anesthesia, Complication. Another we uh, another dies. Uh, we don't make. Uh, we didn't find the real the real costs, real reason. Uh, so I think uh, hybrid uh, uh, treat hybrid surgery to treat the uh, uh, colostrum even it is safe. Uh, 
that's all this uh, if something not, not not right and i can i can't express my words you, you can refer to me thank you Thank you, Professor Ding. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Bing Zhu, your comment? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Deng Chenping uh, presented the uh, avium of uh, corpus callosum. Uh, you said the a young boy was died of uh, hypersomnia uh, mm, yeah. on the operation table. What? Uh, on operation table. Yeah, yes. Uh, after, 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 in, in, after uh, or before? During, during, during the surgery. Uh, we have totally reset, resected the removed the AVMs. Mm -hmm. But at that, that time, the body temperature was, was increased. Uh, at the beginning, we found uh, some something wrong. But the, 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 and I said they found that the temperature is, um, is 42 oh, okay. centigrade. So his heart uh, was Arrested. Yes, we we also have encountered some this uh, this kind of uh, mali uh, so called malignant uh, hypersomnia. It's a very dangerous. It's a very uh, fatal complication. But you explained that another uh, uh, fatal case is a uh, uh, before the surgery. There's a big uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But after surgery, the the capture was uh, capture was uh, disappeared. Uh, no, 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 no. The, uh -huh. the, the patient just uh, sudden uh, uh, set into a coma. So uh -huh. we think that maybe the tester is high uh, high temperature, uh, high, high, uh -huh. high, high pressure. So, so we start just uh, the first uh, reaction is uh, in section section the the the, the, the oh man, a male sister, the needle, so the sister disappeared. Also, at that time, the, the patient was uh, experiencing uh, rescue, uh, simply for uh, blood, uh, heart, heart uh, was rest. So he would say, would say, at that time maybe the the brain was swell, swell. So, um, it's chemo, maybe the uh, time to uh, uh, pressure from the brain uh, swell, 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 swollen, uh, maybe also make the uh, sister disappear. Oh, we think maybe um, at the first time we treated the sister, then we resect the AVM is better. Uh, post hoc analysis, we think that this is maybe better for, for this patient. Uh, why we think, don't think it is related to the surgery? After the surgery, the, the patient is very well. Uh, he can communicate with us very clearly. His legs also uh, normal. So I think it's not related, directly related to the surgery. Okay, is there any, do you think, is there any some uh, improvisation uh, thrombos maybe in the vein, in uh, the training vein maybe. Uh, maybe uh, for the first uh, CT uh, CT scan we can we can uh, so any schema or also we can see any um, version of the uh, brain. So uh, also in the during surgery we didn't uh, destroy or injure to the brain wing. So I think um, it's not a uh, the real. Uh, we, we can we also re review the video, uh, certain video, the bridge wing keep uh, very well. Okay, thank you. So, Dr. Liu. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Professor Ding. <laughs> Do you have May I ask you one question, Professor? Uh, in, in, in the cases that uh, you did uh, embolization, and uh, subsequent angiogram shows uh, a completely uh, embolized uh, AVM. So in those cases, uh, do you repeat uh, angiogram in the future? Uh, if so, uh, how, how's, how is the uh, frequency uh, of uh, uh, repeating the angiogram? Um, 
徐徐徐主任，能帮中文跟我说最后一个，听清楚。啊，呃，你多久复查一次这种？啊，如果还有残留的话，啊、嗯。Um, uh, most of the cases for for res residual aliens we will uh, uh follow it half a half a year. If a residual, if there is no residual, we will uh follow it for one year. Uh, at the beginning of the hybrid uh, surgery, I think that the alien was resected totally. We didn't we didn't uh. uh Demand the the patient to follow and follow up with the DIC, but uh, some cases we just uh, followed it. We found that some ex, uh, also found found a recurrence of uh, some cases. So uh, after that time, we will follow it one year with the DIC. Uh, uh, this is uh, also a hot uh, demand. At the beginning, we didn't want it, but now it's routine. Okay, uh, Dr. Deng, would you uh, refer the patient with some small residue to the uh, gamma knife or cyber knife for the further treatment or just uh, for another session of the embolization? Uh, for colosome AVMs, mm -hmm. we can, I think we can treat it with a hybrid, uh, with a, a virus, uh, uh, low rate, low complication rate, um, but uh, for some case, for some patient, if it didn't receive the open surgery, also we can uh, embolize it very well. So we will refer the patient to the uh, radio surgery. Uh, for uh, you, you, you can see that uh, most of our cases are bleeding, so we will treat it uh, aggressively. Okay. Hello, Prof. Raja. You have any question, Professor Ding? I have one Hello. question. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, please, please ask this, Prof. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation about your great experience. And you, uh, you have some cases uh, cured only by the embolization. And uh, do you? Do you intentionally plan to treat only by the embolization in such cases, or uh, you plan first uh, hybrid treatment, and but uh, the AVM uh, can be cured only embolization? Uh, uh, some cases uh, or, or treat uh, with the embolization, but at the beginning, we when we make uh, a treating plan. I want to treat it uh, with a uh, hybrid surgery. But uh, during when uh, embolization, we will every, after every every time of uh, embolization, we will make uh, a roasting DSA. Uh, uh, we can make uh, a 3D uh, re re rebuilding. So we found the supply of the, uh, found the supply of the, found the, the rest part of the AVMs. Sometimes we realize we can uh, embolize it is totally. So we change our uh, direction of treatment. We will try, uh, try my best to embolize it uh, uh, to to totally. But uh, uh, this is for this, this group of colossum event. Also for other part of other part, uh, part of events, sometimes we try to embolize it uh, totally, but sometimes it failed then. We will directly to we will get, uh, progress to re recycle it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Raja. You have any question? No, thank you. Thank you, Liu. First of all, let me apologize to you and all the chairs and speakers and panelists because I had a very long day in the theater. Really sorry. You may carry on, please. I will call uh, upon uh, Professor uh, Binzu for a uh, concluding uh, uh, comment or remarks, Professor. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Ten Champing. Uh, thank you for your nice and very honest presentation for the uh, ABM treatment of our cups colossum. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Professor Ding.
uh, Professor Isaac, nice meeting you. Thank you for joining our ACNS uh, webinar program. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. So, uh, Professor Kono, we, we chair your session. I will pass uh, the session to Professor Kono. Please, Professor. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Professor Kono from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, regarding the treatment options of vestibular schwannoma include surgery, uh, radio surgery or radiotherapy, and uh, waiting and scan. Uh, today we have a, a lecture from Professor Yan about uh, surgery and radio surgery on, on vestibular schwannomas. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Yan. Ah, so. Nice to see you, and uh, it's my great honor to uh, chair your lecture. Uh, would you start? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to thank the uh, Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Uh, thank you, Professor Kono. Uh, thank you, Professor Jubin, uh, Dr. Cuddy, and Dr. Liu. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, it's really a, a remarkable silver lining of the pandemic that I can come to you through Zoom. Uh, when it's uh, different time zones and different continents. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be talking about a topic that's uh, near and dear to me, which are uh, acoustic neuromas and how to treat them both surgically and radiosurgically. Uh, I think it's pretty well established for the past 20 or 30 years that stereotactic radiosurgery has emerged as a viable treatment option for acoustic neuromas, in addition to surgery and observation. I think the question for the modern era is when to apply uh, radiosurgery and when to apply surgery. And then the future, I think, just uh, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, uh, is a hybrid approach, is when can you take the best of all worlds and try to put them together um, for surgery? Um, my interest in acoustic neuroma started more than 20 years ago, uh, looking at how to preserve hearing, that the first treatment for uh, treating radio surgery for acoustic neuromas was trying to preserve hearing. And this started uh, in a movement, uh, I, I think in 2008, when the Congress of Neurological Surgeons here in the United States and the AANS and ASTRO uh, came up with a definition for what radio surgery would be versus radiotherapy. And in this large meta-analysis, we found that in treating over 5,000 patients, that the overall hearing preservation for radio surgery of all kinds was roughly 55 to 60%. So 57% was overall hearing preservation. That if you're looking at trying to preserve hearing, that roughly 60% of uh, patients would preserve hearing. And, and this is now being moved because I know that Dr. Regi and other groups are look at, and the Pittsburgh group uh, here in the United States are looking at early radio surgery to preserve hearing in a uh, very curious and excited to see that development and where that future will go. But th this is where we started looking at overall hearing preservation. And I think this is important baseline to have when you look at uh, outcomes of acoustic neuroma treatments and how to treat them with radio surgery and, and, and surgery. If you look at the other side, though, if you look at facial nerve preservation, facial nerve preservation is exceedingly good with radiation. It's exceedingly good. The overall uh, facial preservation rate in this paper and in the study that we did uh, uh, decades ago now, it was over 96%, 96%. And I, I do think it starts to approach 99 to 100%, except for the rare cases of Bell's palsy. Um, it, it's really remarkable how safe and how robust the facial nerve is uh, in relation to the hearing preservation and in terms of how safe radio surgery is in terms for hearing pre uh, facial pre preservation. So if the ultimate goal is facial nerve preservation, I think radio surgery has something to be considered and is a strong impact and influencer in our de uh, decisions. And how can uh, using that complication profile help us uh, treat our patients uh, to maximize their outcomes? Well, one of the things that we did after this was to look at this definition of radio surgery versus radiotherapy. As I mentioned earlier, the, the major governing bodies of the United States came and said, we're going to collaborate and universally decide amongst the three of them that radiosurgery would be five fractions or less 
uh, and that radiotherapy would be greater than five fractions. Uh, now, this was in 2008, and when this happened, I thought perhaps this would gain traction and that uh, these definitions would become more clear. But what's happened, I think, with hypofractionation and multifractions is that over the past 20 years, it's actually become less clear uh, and that these definitions become more and more murky. Um, but looking at the number of fractions, we looked at radiotherapy and radiosurgery to see what was the difference in these particular outcomes. And so we looked at all the patients that we treated at UCLA between 1996 and 2010, um, which uh, was over a decade ago already now, uh, looking at the treatment of radiosurgery versus radiotherapy. Um, the median dose for radiosurgery was 12 gray. Uh, and uh, the average dose for the radiotherapy was 50.4 gray. Uh, and, and we had a, a follow-up of almost four years in both cohorts. Uh, these are the patient population uh, characteristics of the two cohorts, radiosurgery versus radiotherapy. Uh, they're pretty matched up, uh, but this was not a case control study. But when you look at the overall hearing preservation results, we have to remember that the earlier all comers radio surgery, gamma knife, single dose, cyber knife, the overall hearing preservation was about 60%. That was 10 years prior to this study. And what was very reassuring was that even in this more single population study, it recapitulated almost the exact data is that radio surgery had a hearing preservation rate of about 60%. And this is in single fraction. So I, I feel pretty confident that that data is very robust and is probably near uh, what the actual hearing preservation rate is. For radiotherapy, and, and this is interesting, number one, it has a better hearing preservation. That smaller fractions over smaller doses over multiple fractions, more fractions, had an improved hearing preservation. That's the first thing to note. The second thing is that this was not controlled for size or, or location of, of tumor. Uh, and that's a frequent criticism of this approach. But Radiotherapy is going to be more applied for larger tumors, tumors that are bigger versus smaller. And so even if the tumor is bigger, it appeared that radiotherapy was better for hearing preservation than radiosurgery. Um, if you do the Kaplan-Meier curve for this, though, we found that after about 10 years, the hearing preservation rate was a wash so that radiotherapy did indeed have a window of improved hearing preservation, but that window was probably 10 years uh, or so approximately, because after that point, all the hearing preservation rate became the same. And so it, it was a window that we think that radiotherapy is an improvement for hearing preservation, uh, but not a giant one, uh, but there is an absolute clear and, and definitional window. And, and this was initially done by one of my fellows, Dr. Choi, uh, who's now up at UCSF. Uh, and, and we published this paper in uh, the Congress, the CNS uh, journal here in the United States, uh, I, I think about 10 years ago. We followed up that study and said, well, then why? Why? Why is the radiosurgical uh, hearing preservation so much worse than fractionated radiotherapy? Why is there a difference? And what we did was we went back to all over 200 plans and we looked at the cochlear dose of all of them. And so we evaluated all the treatment plans and we had all the hearing preservation and hearing clinical outcomes, but we went back and we, and we did cochlear, cochlear contouring. Now, this is not straightforward. This, at that time, uh, 10 years ago, this was not part of our most operandi. This was not part of our contouring software. But what we did was we went back and we found the cochlea by looking at the T2 MRI. And here you can see, if you pull up the T2 MRI, the cochlea will be hyper intense. Once we found where the cochlea was, we then superimposed that on the CT scan because uh, the cochlea is more than just a fluid signal. And we use that to fuse that with the CT scan to identify the cochlea in its entirety on the CT scan. And once we did that, we were then able to identify and recognize the cochlear dosing in all of these patients. What we found was we think the cochlear dose is what ultimately pushes hearing preservation in single fraction versus multiple fraction radio surgery. Here in this initial paper, you see that below eight gray, which made a lot of sense for us 
um, had a statistically significant impact on the, on the hearing preservation, that if you could keep the cochlear dose less than eight gray, that the hearing preservation um, uh, was, was better than if the cochlear dose was higher. We've subsequently followed this with uh, subsequent papers, and we have found that the cochlear dose less than six gray and actually even four gray, five, four or five gray or less, 4.5 gray actually, that the lower you can keep it, the better the hearing preservation. That we have found that this is a continual effect that uh, at the time of this paper, it changed our protocol to keep the cochlear dose less than eight. But what we have found is that as you keep the cochlear dose lower and lower, approaching five or four gray, that the hearing preservation in single fraction radio surgery, you'll have a better outcome in treating these patients. And so cochlear dose was significantly associated with uh, uh, hearing preservation. What we found was that in multi-fraction radiotherapy, that the cochlear dose did not have a significant clinical outcome. So in radiotherapy, cochlear dose in the bite-sized multi-fraction treatment did not have a significant improve, uh, impact on hearing preservation. What's also important to recognize is that we found tumor control was comparable and the same in both radiosurgery and radiotherapy. So if you're just focused on oncological control, radiosurgery and radiotherapy, they are the same. But if you're looking at hearing preservation, radiotherapy appears to have a slight advantage over radiosurgery if you cannot keep the single fraction cochlear dose below six to five gray. The radiotherapy may have a slight advantage. And that advantage window, though, may become a wash after 10 years. And if you want the specific impact of that uh, paper, you can uh, look up th this paper, which has the specific details. Uh, this was led by my fellow, uh, Dr. Chung, uh, who's now uh, at USC uh, from neurosurgery. Um, and, and there's that paper. But if you look at these outcomes and you say, well, acoustic neuroma hearing preservation is 60% and it can be only maybe 80% with radiotherapy and the facial nerve preservation is 96% plus, and I would say maybe 98, 99%. But if those outcomes are so excellent, we should just treat everything with radiosurgery. And I would push back on that and say, no, I think radiosurgery is fantastic and is ideal for its select patient population but it doesn't always work and it's not for everyone. And so the other side of that coin is surgical treatments and how do we treat our patients? And this is um, even further back uh, uh, than the initial paper I showed. This is a patient that we initially treated, you can see the acoustic neuroma, was treated with radio surgery, had a very consistent swelling, which we typically see um, we typically see this swelling after a single treatment radio surgery, and then a year after the radio surgery, the tumor started to shrink. Two years after radio surgery, this particular tumor had a remarkable um, uh, shrinking of the tumor. But then two and a half years after that, this patient presented with sudden, sudden uh, right facial numbness and weakness and a large expansion of this tumor. And this patient ultimately required neurosurgical intervention through a retrosigmoid. And so if you look at the surgical treatments, what are the outcomes of treating patients with microsurgery? And microsurgery for acoustic neuromas has, has to be more nuanced than just open surgery. Just like how radiosurgery has single fraction versus multiple fractions, in surgery, there are multiple approaches to acoustic neuromas. For smaller tumors, some surgeons will approach it with a middle fossa craniotomy. For patients without hearing, a lot of surgeons will treat it with a translabyrinthine approach. And then the workhorse for most neurosurgeons is a retrosigmoid approach with or without drilling out the IAC. But what we found in our series of looking at many, many patients treated with surgery was that the complication profile was also correlated with the surgical approach. So we found that patients who had a translabyrinthine approach had the highest rate of CSF leak, but their facial nerve preservation may have been better because if you do a translab surgery, you'll know and recognize that you identify the facial nerve very early in the surgery. 
Conversely, for a retrosigmoid surgery, this had a lower CSF leak rate. And I think it's because you can do a direct primary dural closure, try to get that water tight, and or possibly buttress that with fat. But it had a higher rate of infection. And as anyone that does the retrosig for an acoustic knows, 90, 99% of the time, the facial nerve is one of the later things you identify. You identify it after the tumor. And if you identify it very, very late, you identify it at the end of surgery. And I think that identification of the most important things leads to a higher CN, uh, cranial nerve complication issue and rate uh, with the retrosig. I also think exposing the lower cranial nerves and or the CP angle may lead to higher cranial nerve complications. So it's not clear exactly which one is best. But if you look at specifically retrosigmoid surgery for acoustic neuromas, the first thing you have to recognize is that surgery complication profile is changed by size. And this is a real subtle distinction because for radio surgery, size in all those studies had no significant impact on clinical outcomes. But for surgery in particular, surgical outcomes are dramatically impacted by size. So that when the tumor here is larger than three centimeters, the first thing that happens is the rate of gross total resection drops. It drops. And, and this is a cohort of surgeons that I respect and know and were some of my teachers, Dr. Larry Pitts, uh, Andrew Parsa, Michael McDermott. I, this cohort of surgeons um, uh, were up at UCSF. And the first thing to recognize is number one, they had a uh, subtotal resection rate of about 25%. They, they already had a gross total resection rate of about 75%, but in a quarter of their cases, they were already leaving subtotal resection. And this was you know, over 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, before the era of uh, hybrid surgery. But when the tumor was large, the rate of subtotal resection started to go up dramatically. And this is uh, statistically significant, and this makes a lot of intuitive sense for how you approach these surgeries, is that the bigger tumors you're gonna have a higher chance of leaving tumor behind. The second thing here is that if you look at hearing preservation, it also drops precipitously. And more importantly, facial nerve preservation also dropped. That the larger tumors had a poorer rate of hearing preservation and a, and a poorer rate, much, much poorer rate of facial nerve preservation. These things become much, much more critical as the tumor gets larger. And so this will have to change the way we approach um, our patients when they have larger tumors, especially when we are treating them with surgery. This was an analysis that we recently published in the Red Journal, looking at post-operative hearing preservation in patients who have acoustic neuromas. And in this cohort of over, over 2,000 patients, we find that if patients had just tumors in the intracanicular portion, their hearing preservation was about 60%. And this is approximating the hearing preservation of radio surgery. So small tumors treated with surgery, their hearing preservation can be comparable to radio surgery. But when the tumors start getting larger outside of just the intracanicular portion, or if the tumor is quite large, hearing preservation rates will drop precipitously down to 10, 15, 20%, less than 20% here in this study. And so a decision to cut is a decision almost to sacrifice hearing. And this is principally mostly with just retrosigmoid. We excluded all translab because obviously in translab, the hearing preservation rate will be zero. But for retrosigmoid, where the goal is hearing preservation, I think if the tumor is sizable and or large, hearing preservation is gonna be a difficult outcome. But it's not impossible. It's not impossible. I concede that. I think most of the times you're gonna have hearing loss and or uh, hearing decline with surgery but not all the time. This is one of my cases here where we had an acoustic neuroma here on the right side. You can see the tumor. We did a retrosigmoid uh, surgery. This is the preoperative audiogram. You can see the poor right-sided uh, pure tone hearing curve here. And you can see the speech discrimination was 48% before surgery. We did a surgery. We did a near total resection. You can see that there's a small residual here at the porous. Uh, if the tumor is extremely adherous uh, to the nerves and to the facial nerve, especially right here at the opening of the internal auditory canal, uh, I think that if you start losing facial nerve function or if the stimulation starts going up and it's very difficult to dissect off, 
my preference is to leave a small residual and keep the facial nerve intact uh, and the facial function well. But we had a little bit of uh, uh, residual, but what I really want to point out here is that there's in a, a slight improvement in the pure tone average, but what's really remarkable is that the speech discrimination went up in this patient after uh, surgical intervention. So I can see that for intracanicular tumors principally, and for some small tumors, hearing preservation is a, a possible outcome. But I do think we need to have an honest conversation about the lowering statistical odds, that the odds of saving hearing statistically decline, especially as the tumor gets larger with surgery. So if that's true, and the bigger the tumor is, can we modify our outcomes, have better hearing preservation and or facial nerve preservation with changing the surgical outcomes? And this is where I don't know. The answer is I don't know. The answer is maybe. But the first thing to look at in terms of extended resection is if you're going to do a subtotal resection, does this change the long-term durability? The first thing isn't hearing preservation or facial nerve outcomes. It's actually tumor control. And so this is a cohort that we looked up at UCSF in over 772 patients. You can see here, the first thing to recognize again is that even here in the pre-hybrid era, in about 25% of patients, there was still subtotal resection. This was before uh, uh, this era of trying to identify what should we do with the surgery. But in this modern era, and this is from that specific paper that you can, you can download and look at the details, is that looking at gross total resection, near total resection, and subtotal resection. And when you have radio surgery, which is a remarkably good treatment for acoustic neuromas with a high tumor control rate, in this era, if you follow these patients, what happens? And this follow-up is actually upwards of eight to 10 years. That after gross total, near total, and subtotal resection, the recurrence rate is about 88, um, I'm so sorry. The recurrence rate is somewhere between 10 and 20% at 10, 10 to 20 years. And that this statistical outcome was not different with long enough follow-up, that the tumor control rate was gonna be 80% to 90%, no matter what kind of resection was achieved, whether it's subtotal, near total, or gross total resection. Now I do concede this is in the modern era, and I'm sure there's radio surgery as an adjunct to many of these treatments, uh, patients, especially with growth. But what I do want to recognize is that even with the gross total resection, even when 100% of the tumor was removed in the surgeon's opinion, there was still a failure rate. And I think this is still being proven true. This was published uh, I, I, about 10 years ago, um, but oh, actually even longer, about 15 years ago. But more, even more recently, if you look at the more recent data that follows up, uh, especially out of UCSF, or Hopkins, uh, that, or, uh, that if you look at the recurrence rate after gross total resection rate, it's still somewhere between 5 to 15%, even after gross total resection. And so the question is, are we really treating all these tumors the same with radi radiation and surgery? And perhaps there's about a 5 to 15% of atypical, I, I know I'm making up classifications now, but atypical acoustic neuroma a different kind, something that has a bad molecular profile that was going to be bad from the beginning. Because even if you get gross total resection, in about 15%, 10 to 15% of these patients, they still grow back. And if you get near total, some of them grow back. If you get subtotal, some of them grow back. And that this number, even upwards of 80 months or more follow-up, is approximately the same. And so this changes the game of tumor control. That tumor control is going to be comparable whether you look at gross total, near total, or subtotal, especially if, if you have radiation as an adjunct to surgical treatment. And so this will change our patient's outcomes, our patient's long-term morbidity and mortality, and how we can treat our patients in terms of doing both surgery and radiation. So if we can balance doing resection and, and harming our patients, how can we balance that? And one of the ways is with improved imaging. So we do DTI imaging. Uh, I was really inspired when I went to Hanover and watched Dr. Sami operate uh, on acoustic neuromas. And this DTI technology, especially as Im imaging improves, can help us localize the facial nerve. And so we were doing DTI imaging to localize the facial nerve. And what we found was that DTI imaging 
makes beautiful images. You can see the tumor here and the nerves uh, located around the tumor, but it did not improve outcomes at all. The house Brackman score, subtotal, gross total uh, resections, they were all no change, no statistically significant difference, but it does make really nice images that you can identify the facial nerve with. And so this is something that we are trying to do to see if it can improve surgical outcomes, accurately image the facial nerve. It's not 100% uh, capable in every patient. Sometimes when the facial nerve is flat and sp splayed out, it will, the imaging will fail to recognize uh, the facial nerve. Um, and this is that paper, if you want to uh, look at this, um, uh, by one of my previous fellows, Dr. Ung, uh, who's uh, now in Arizona. Um, but this is the, the details of that paper. And so if you really want to put I, personalized surgery, balancing harm and surgical resection and doing the best, what's the ideal target then? What is the ideal target for how to approach um, uh, surgery for acoustic neuromas? Because I think in the past, this is how we did it. We said, here is a tumor. This is something we do for surgery. Voila, I got gross total resection. She's House Brackman 2 immediately post-op. And in my clinic, she's post-op uh, House Brackman 1. I am, that's it. We're done. That's how you treat acoustic neuroma. And I think that was the way acoustic neuroma surgeries can be approached. And we had good outcome. But I think as we look towards how to improve outcomes and look at the future, the surgery can no longer be what's feasible. It has to be what is the most ideal and optimal outcomes. Um, because, because when you look at surgery, oops, when you look at surgery, uh, you want to identify what's the best outcomes for each individual patient. Some patients will have different age, different size, different patient goals and expectations, comorbidities, uh, their own personal quality of life, and ultimately what's most important for them uh, and, and their individual out outcomes. And so I think the question, the most important question coming to surgical and radiosurgical treatment for acoustic neuromas is what is the ideal resection? And this is such a hard question to ask. And it's a, such a hard question to study when you have so many neurosurgeons here. If you ask every single surgeon, what's the ideal resection, you're gonna get so many different opinions uh, about what's the best way to treat and what's the best way to treat them. Um, and so I think as we look forward to this, that doing a good subtotal resection is actually harder than doing a good gross total resection. If you stop and think about that, what's a good gross total resection? That's easy. Just take the 100% of the tumor out, done. What is the perfect subtotal resection? That, that's a very hard question. I think it's harder to do that. This is a, a, a case where we had an acoustic neuroma and we said, we're gonna do a subtotal resection. We thought there was only very little bit of tumor left. We thought that we did a near, uh, uh, total resection, but actually this was a subtotal resection. We did not think there was a lot of tumor left and there was some tumor left. And this is okay, but not what we thought as surgeons. And I think this is why it really shows it is harder to do a good subtotal resection than it is to do a gross total because a gross total, you just take it all out. And so what is the ideal resection? Because doing this, a good subtotal, I think is harder to define. I'm not advocating for cowardly surgery. I'm saying take it to the edge and know whether there's a bridge that you can keep going on or if there's an edge and you're gonna fall off the cliff. We don't advocate for leaving large amounts of tumor behind, especially in safe locations. I'm saying that we ought to devascularize and debulk and try to take out as much as you can to make the smallest radiosurgical target that's ideal for patients an ideal for the risk benefit ratio. And I think this is very important to know where the risk is. I also think this is different for every surgeon. Every surgeon will have a different risk point because everyone's surgical skill is different. And then if you go further, everyone's risk point will be different based on their time. My career in my time, I thought I was so good when I came out of residency. I thought I was so good 10, 15 years ago, but I'm much, much better now. So that risk point for me is much different now 
because I'm significantly better now than I used to be. And I hope 10 to 15 years from now that I'll be better too. A little bit, maybe. Uh, for sure, I hope I'm better. But that risk point, that risk benefit ratio point is different for every surgeon and where you are in your career. And so if you know where that risk point is, that allows you to identify when does it become too risky to take out more tumor or less? I think that's something that every surgeon should at least contemplate as a theoretical possibility. And so we decided to try to attack this question. What is the ideal resection? By saying, okay, we need a cohort of surgeons and we're gonna ask them, number one, you must leave residual tumor. And I know that's a philosophical debate and controversial, but if in the parameters of the study, I came to you and said, look, Here's the acoustic neuroma. Number one, you must leave subtotal. There's no way to get gross. We're in a theoretical world, so there's no, this is a conversation to have. And if you could contour and show me what kind of residual you would leave, that's the study we did. So these were all my patients, all of my cases. Uh, the tumor was an acoustic neuroma. We did a retrosigmoid surgery. This was an eight hour surgery. This is the volumetric analysis of the initial tumor. And we took it to one neurosurgeon and skull based surgeon and said, what's the residual you should leave? And, and this is the residual they contour, 24%. Neurosurgeon number two, 26%. Neurosurgeon number three, th th this is all the way we did it, these different neurosurgeons. And we, we pulled different neurosurgeons. We took a laptop to them and said, contour the residual. Uh, I, I, we worked with a company called Brain Lab that came up with a uh, adaptive hybrid surgery software. And this is what they recommended as ideal resection. And these are all of my cases. And so these actually happened. I did surgery and this was the actual residual. This is 8% uh, residual post-op. This is what that looks like uh, visually. So this is the patient. This is the acoustic neuroma. This is what that first neurosurgeon contoured said. If you're going to leave residual, this is what you leave behind. You can see that this is another neurosurgeon said, just leave this residual behind by the brainstem. Um, and then this is also another neurosurgeon that contoured it. This is what the software recommended, saying that this is the minimum impact that you need to make this a radiosurgical target. And then this is the actual outcome, is that there's a small residual here that I could not peel off the brainstem uh, and the, the lateral medulla there. And so we did this on multiple patients. It's another patient that we did. You can see it visually, um, uh, the contouring, uh, again, the, the slight residual here against uh, the medulla that, that could not be peeled off. Um, we were looking for cases of mine that had residual, so we, we were trying to do that. And overall, what we found consistently, number one, was that there was great variability amongst the neurosurgeons in their planning. Number two was that the ideal resection was always more than what we left behind. And that me, myself, in my experience, I'm just like everybody else, that I took out perhaps more tumor than I needed to that compared to the computer software. And number two, that I'm trying, that my training and my outcomes are similar to what other neurosurgeons think. And so we looked at the variability. And number one, we found that the variability is off the charts, essentially, that we all have different ideas of what an ideal resection is. And I think this is a conversation we all need to have about how to treat acoustic neuromas uh, ideally in the future, even if the plan is to have a subtotal resection. And we found that uh, this surgical training and this computer software is different in how you approach uh, the subtotal resection plan. But the most interesting finding we had here, and this was not statistically significant, there was a trend, but this patient pop, the, the cohort, it was underpowered to identify the statistical significance of this, but was as my surgical outcomes, and these are all my cases, as my surgical outcomes came closer to the computer software planning, my house Brackman scores had a slight improvement. And so perhaps if we can find the ideal safety parameters, we can have improved facial nerve outcomes. We don't know where those safety parameters are. I, I don't know. I don't think my colleagues know. And I don't mean that critically. I'm just saying we collectively don't know. I think that there is a point. I think we can have that point. I think it may be one that's a consensus. And also there's going to be a point for every surgeon individualizing and specifically. And so I think surgeons need to know radio surgery because if you don't know how they're going to treat the residual tumor, you can't contour your intraoperative surgery to leave a better radiosurgical target for our surgeons. And uh, that paper we just published 
um, uh, Dr. Shepard here, who uh, is, is going to Yale, uh, and Dr. Logman, who's at neurosurgery at Case Western. Uh, the, they were the principals on this uh, paper, and, and we published uh, this paper. And then the last frontier, and I know we're talking about radiosurgical and surgical treatment of acoustic neuromas. I do think the, the end point of acoustic neuromas will be molecular therapies, uh, looking at targets. Um, acoustic neuromas are a very hard uh, entity and a tumor to identify by molecular pathology because we all know that they have Antony A and Antony B bodies, but there's a great heterogeneity on any particular pathology slide. We hypothesize that acoustic neuromas have a micro hemorrhage or local inflammatory response that leads to uh, loss of hearing. And that this focal immune response is what causes uh, uh, this compromise of, of hearing and the cochlear nerve focally, because if the acoustic neuroma is actually a vestibular nerve, vestibular tumor, how does this cause adjacent hearing loss? And so what we did was we looked at a database of patients who had tumors that we also had uh, uh, hearing outcomes uh, preserver, preserved. We also use a schematic of an overlying tissue grid. That way we could get a more uh, representative picture of the local inflammation. This way, this was uh, a gross picture of one way we can look at the entire tumor without biasing the pathological outcome and the assessment. And what we found was indeed that the increased rate of microhemorrhage and fibrosis in the acoustic neuroma tissue sample had an increased rate of hearing loss. And that this is why we think an acoustic neuroma causes uh, that hearing loss. Things that um, cause the odds risk ratio of hearing loss, number one, tumor in the cistern. And I think this is going to be a key thing in all outcomes because the, the cistern is a bony tube. And if you have pressure in that bony tube, you can apply more pressure to the cochlea uh, through that apparatus. We found that this hemorrhage and this local scarring definitely increased the risk for hearing loss and age uh, because hearing decreases as your age goes up. And this is a paper that we published looking at this intratumoral microhemorrhage. The last thing is to look at this uh, extracellular matrix protein too. Uh, this was a study that we did uh, that we found by pure serendipity, absolutely pure luck. Um, this is a extracellular matrix protein too is a surface marker uh, that we are looking actually in glioblastoma. So my lab, we are studying glioblastoma. And this is the actual pictures from uh, looking at GBM and EMP2 staining. That's a higher grade in GBM versus lower grade. Well, we were doing a tissue microarray, and my fellow Dr. Chung and Dr. Penny Yotis, who's a neurosurgeon at Oklahoma now, they're putting in all these tissues into the microarray, and they had three empty slots. And they said, Dr. Yang, you know, what should we do, professor? Should we just run the TMA? And I said, no, that's valuable money, <laughs> those resources. Just put anything in. I don't care. I don't care what you put in. And we had some meningiomas and acoustic neuromas in the sample. And the acoustic neuromas came back positive uh, for EMP2 and the meningioma. So now we're currently studying meningiomas with EMP2. Uh, and we uh, won a uh, research grant to look at uh, uh, meningiomas and EMP2 from the uh, North American Skull Bay Society. And now we're also looking at EMP2 and acoustic neuromas. And we just recently won a grant from the Acoustic Neuroma Association uh, of America to look at this particular protein in acoustic neuromas. And I think that is the final frontier, which is looking at surgery in one cohort and then looking at radio surgery and it's looking at how we can make a hybrid to do the best individualized approach for the patient. And I think if I can look even maybe 15 or 20 years, and really, as we look at these modern vaccines and these mRNA vaccines that are targeted for specific protein molecules, if we can find specific markers on each tumor, the next level of individualized medicine is to identify the specific markers of each patient and then develop a, a, a more uh, either an immunotherapy approach or a more uh, less invasive approach to treat those patients uh, with individualized medicine. I don't do this work alone. I, there's a whole team of, of, of much younger, much smarter uh, harder working people than me, and, and I have to thank 
all of them here, as you can see, uh, they, they are uh, my team and they help us get this done. I also need to thank everyone at the UCLA Brain Tumor Program. Uh, none of this is done in solo. I want to thank in particular Dr. Quentin Gopin. He is my ENT colleague uh, who is my ENT counterpart in the Acoustic Normal pro Program. Uh, but everyone at UCLA uh, is part of the team. All the funding that allows me to do my work, both surgically and for research, uh, I could not do it without. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can always contact me. If you're old, you can email me, like me. If you're young, you can DM me on social media. Uh, but I, I'm always available, and I just want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang. Nice lecture. So uh, if there are any questions or comments from the audience, Professor Liu. Uh, thank you, Professor Kono. Thank you, Professor Yang. Uh, may, may you unshare your screen, uh, Professor uh, Yang? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Professor, I have, uh, uh, probably I start with a few questions, Professor. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, fractionation in uh, SRS, do you think that the main aim is to be able to treat a larger tumor, larger than 3.5? Uh, a centimeter tumor or mainly for the caring of fashion of preservation and at the current technology what is the largest size of the tumor of uh, acoustic sonoma can be treated with srs my second question professor regarding those with the pre-existing hearing and facial uh, loss a fashion nerve function loss uh, will you prescribe a higher dose a 14 gray rather than 12 gray or 13 gray uh, my last question professor how do you define uh, uh, recurrences in the subtotal resection and also in the SRS cases where the tumor control are the term that use. Uh, how do you define recurrences compared to uh, tumor growing? Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, those are such great questions. Those might be some of the best questions I've ever received uh, on acoustic neuromas. Uh, great, great question. So, the first one was, is acoustic neuromas being treated with radiation for hearing preservation or size? And I really think the answer is both. I, I think the answer is both. That uh, it's, it's being proven that radio surgery is very good for hearing preservation. Uh, and so I think that is a, is a very good outcome. But the real goal has to be tumor control. I personally do not like treating tumors bigger than 2.5 or 3 centimeters with radiation. I don't. That, that's my personal. That's not science. <laughs> that's not science. That's, that's just me. That's my, my heart. But if you're looking at some of the more recent data, especially coming out of Pittsburgh uh, and some of the larger series, they're pushing 4 centimeters. They're pushing. There's data. There's science. There's state science that shows you can treat upwards of 4, if not bigger, with radiation and or fractionated radiation. And that's really hard for me to do. That's hard for me to follow the science because uh, I think that's quite big. Do I think there are ideal patients for that? Yeah. If I have an 80 year old patient who has comorbidity and a four centimeter acoustic, that patient might be the one that I might treat. And, and so I personally don't like treating tumors that are bigger than 2.5 or three centimeters with radiation, but do I think it's good and that there's a window for it and the right patients? Yes, but uh, it, it's hard for me to, to do that. And I don't have too many of those patients like that. The second thing is if there's a lot of swelling or edema, which is hard to assess and we don't really talk about that, uh, I think those are gonna be harder to treat with uh, radiation. Uh, and, and then in those patients, if that patient is that old, I think hearing preservation, the priority of it drops. You know, if the patient's 80 years old with a four centimeter acoustic, I don't care anymore about hearing preservation. I just, I just want that patient to have good tumor control. And so uh, I'll treat that patient however I need to, uh, but I think it's, it, it, it becomes a difficult thing to uh, assess. But I do think people are pushing the boundaries because 20 years ago, I, 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 the older callers will know that it used to be 1.5 centimeters, two centimeters, right? It used to be a very small window. And then slowly it's bigger, 2.2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4. That window slowly grew. And so uh, I think uh, people are pushing that boundaries. And where that boundary is, 
firmly, I don't know, uh, but I think people are treating bigger and bigger tumors uh, with acoustic neuromas uh, for sure. Um, so that was the first question. The second question was... Uh, prescribed dose for pre-existing uh, hearing loss. Poison. Oh, that's right. That's right. So for pre-existing hearing loss, uh, the first thing is if you have a small tumor only in the intracanicular canal and the hearing is gone, I recommend nothing. <laughs> the first thing is observation. Why? You've already lost hearing. The hearing is already gone. There's nothing to save. And so that's a weird window. But if there's a small tumor, very small, only in the canal, my first recommendation is to do nothing. No surgery, no radiation, do nothing. Why? The hearing is already gone. Hearing is already zero. If the hearing is gone, this now becomes a good question, which is, I still treat with 12 gray, but I don't think it's wrong to treat with 14 gray. Because if you look at what we treat, our meningiomas, our meningiomas, we treat with 14 gray. And we have excellent tumor control. Uh, I think historically, and there's historical precedent at UCLA where they went up to 16 gray, you know, in the early days of acoustic, but the facial nerve palsy rate, and this is not published because nobody wants to publish this, but at 16 gray, facial palsy rate or facial weakness, it starts going up pretty dramatically. Uh, I would say roughly 20, 30%. And so I think the higher dose, you're going to see more facial nerve outcomes that you don't like. Uh, but the lower dose is probably safer. And so I think it's probably okay to go to 14 gray if the hearing is gone, but you're probably, if you treat enough patients, like a million patients, you're probably going to have a slight increase in facial outcomes that are not favorable. And so it's a delicate balance. Uh, and I think it's 12 gray. Uh, the real question is like, how do you treat people with recurrent acoustics, uh, tumors that keep growing, maybe NF2 patients that are more difficult that's a window that I think um, it's less well identified what the ideal outcome is. But for sporadic tumors, I think it's pretty well established that 12 gray uh, should be the, the treatment. It's also a very excellent question. And then I'm so sorry, what's the last question? Uh, how to define recurrences in uh, oh, post yes. uh, FRS. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and these are all things we need to collectively as a world, the universe needs to agree on all of this. What's radio surgery? How many fractions? What's the dose? Um, isodose lines. Uh, we don't have good, even for hearing preservation, you know, PTA and, and speech discrimination, we don't have good universal definition, even an audiogram for all our patients. But we should have an identification of what recurrence is. I don't know what the exact or best definition is, but for our studies and for our patients, we try to find continued growth over two MRIs. So that over two MRIs, if they're continued growth, that probably leads, that's probably a good definition for recurrence that either needs treatment, either surgically or radiation. The only caveat to that is with after radiation, there's a good number of these tumors that swell, especially in that first three to 18 months. And so in that window, I wouldn't call that recurrence or tumor failure or, or radiation failure. But outside of that window, about three months to two years after radiation, after that window, I think if you have two MRIs that show repeat growth, um, I think that's, that's tumor growth after treatment. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Thank you. Excellent, Arjun? excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I Professor would like Arjun? to ask. Yeah. Okay, Laja, Laja, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Kono. Let yeah. me apologize for being late. Yeah. One question. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Isaac Yang for accepting our invitation and uh, giving us such a mesmerizing talk about uh, vestibular schwannomas. Uh, I fully agree with him that there is a risk point for every surgeon, and it differs as we grow in our practice as neurosurgeons. And of course, the risk point is different for different people, as you said earlier. And one question that I would like to put across to him uh, is, what would, what would be his strategy for small tumors who present with hydrocephalus? How would you manage that, Professor Isaac Yang? Um, that's a really good question. The first thing is, 
we find that if you treat larger tumors with radiation, that there's a good cohort of them that present with hydrocephalus. And very early in my career, I thought you had to shunt them. Very early, I got very nervous. You have a large acoustic, you treat radiation, and now they have hydrocephalus. And I thought it needed shunting. I went to the science. Actually, if you look at a lot of the Japanese data, they don't treat, they don't treat the hydrocephalus shunting. And I found that that science is very true. So I've walked that back over the course of my career. Like you said, there's a different point in my career has also evolved is now if there's hydrocephalus, I'm very reluctant to shunt if there's hydrocephalus just due to acoustic neuroma, because uh, I think the complications that you will get are much, much higher. And I really have to give uh, my credit to the Japanese uh, literature, because this is where I really did a deep dive and said, they have a whole, and they do it with confidence. It, it takes that confidence not to treat hydrocephalus. And so uh, if you have hydrocephalus and acoustic neuroma, I try not to treat the hydrocephalus uh, if it's related to the acoustic. Conversely, I think if they have hydrocephalus, it's unrelated. So you, we have to look for the cause, whether it's obstructive, uh, whether it's communicating hydrocephalus or MPH. And, and I'm not a hydrocephalus expert in any way, shape, or form, and I don't want to be. Um, but that's, that's something that has to be fully worked up. But if in the cases where I do see hydrocephalus after radio surgery, so if I have a small tumor, I treat with radio surgery and then I get hydrocephalus, my gentle recommendation would be not to shunt. And I'm going to have to defer to my Japanese colleagues because they're the real experts on this. And they're the ones who gave me confidence not to shunt those patients. Thank you very much. I would like to hear Professor Kono's comments as well, Professor Kono. Uh, another question. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, yes. Uh, Professor Yang. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the cochlea was very sensitive. Uh, the the dose may be less than uh, eight gram mm -hmm. uh, uh, gray is uh, better. So, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, maybe the tumor is uh, bigger than you anticipated. So you have to raise uh, those. So uh, is it possible to try some, uh, like uh, uh, the concept of the hyperfragmented uh, radio surgery, uh, like uh, into two sections, uh, gamma knife treatment? Yes, that's exactly what I, and again, I, I don't know. Obviously the story shows, I don't know anything, but that's what I think the data shows. When we did that initial study, it was eight gray, just like you pointed out. Thank you for listening to a very long talk, but it was eight gray. And so then we changed our modus operandi. If the tumor is close to the cochlea or out in the IAC, you cannot spare the cochlea. And so if, if you, the cochlea was going to get eight gray or more, we said this has to be fractionated. And then we went back and studied more data. We found it was six gray. So then we changed it. If it's six gray or more, you have to do fractionated. And now we think the real truth may be around five or four gray, that if you can keep it less than five or four gray, you should still do single fraction. But if it's more, probably multi-fraction is better for hearing preservation. But this is not a hard 100% rule because sometimes I have patients, they're flying from, I'm in California, and they fly from New York to come see me. And then I show them the data and I say, you have a small tumor, it's near cochlea, you should do... Uh, multi-fraction is better for your cochlea hearing. And they said, no, Dr. Yang, I want single fraction. And I said, no, no, do, 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 look at my data. Look at my life work. <laughs> look at my entire adult life work. You're going to have better outcomes if you multi-fraction. They go, no, Dr. Yang, I want single fraction. And I said, well, then you should go somewhere else. They go, no, no, I want you, Dr. Yang. And I said, okay. So uh, even for a patient that has a small tumor and hearing intact, I'm telling you, I'm <laughs> guilty. Or not, I don't know if I'm guilty, but I'm telling you, I've treated them with single fraction because that's what the patient wanted. They don't want to come for multi-fraction. They don't care. And that's their personal choice. And so I treated them with single fraction, but I did show them. I gave them the data. I gave them the option. I said, this is what I think. This is what I gently recommend. I do think uh, radiotherapy multi-fraction is slightly better for hearing preservation, but I don't know that. I think that, I think that's what the science shows, but I don't know that. That's what I recommend. But if you don't like that, I think single fraction is still a good therapy. 
I think it's still a very safe therapy. I still think you have good 60% hearing preservation. I think after 10 years, it doesn't matter anyways. So if you really want single fraction, I'll still do it. Okay, thank you again. Uh, Professor Yan, uh, so uh, to determine uh, the treatment, uh, the element of age is very important, I think. Yes. So, uh, what do you, uh, what do you think about the uh, radio surgery or radiotherapy uh, for very young patients? They need uh, so actual, uh, genuine, long-term results. So maybe twenties uh, or 30, 30 year long-term result uh, at, uh, at, on average. So uh, we we don't have any uh, such genuine longer uh, longer term uh, results maybe uh, max maximally uh, 10 or uh, 15 years uh, at average on average so what do you think about the very young patient uh, in using uh, radio surgery i generally don't like radiation in young patients hmm. ah, but that's I, good. I, I I don't think this is a hard and fast rule either. Uh, mm. I, there's no absolutes in medicine. Well, 20 years ago, they said only if you're over 75, you get radiation. And then only if you're over 70, only if you're over 65 and 55 and 50. Mm. And now I think people, I think it's roughly 45 or 50. If you're older mm. than 45 or 50, then you do radiation. If you're younger than 45, then they do surgery. But what if you're 44 and 364 days, <laughs> right? Or what if you're 45 and two, two days, something? I think it's kind of blurry. And I agree with you. I think the long-term follow-up, I, I know you said 15 years, but I'd say maybe 20 years, right? I, I, I don't think that's a bad estimate. Some people are going to say 30 years, right? And so just to have the conversation, I'd say 20 years. So if you're 50 years old, if you're 50 years old, and you come in with a small acoustic neuroma and we treat you with radiation, that means that you could probably get to roughly 70, right? And when you get to 70, maybe they will do repeat radiation, right? Repeat radiation, second time radiation. And maybe it won't be as good. So instead of 20 years, maybe only 15, 10 years. So if you're 70 and I get you to 80, 85, I don't care what happens to you after 85. Mm. <laughs> And so, yeah, I, oh. and so th th that's just my philosophical approach. Is this for my family and my brother and my brother's 50 years old? And he says, I do radiation. I said, yeah, that sounds like a good, because you could probably get to 70 or 80 with one dose, probably, right? 80 to 90% chance of tumor control. I'm just saying, right? Possible. You don't know. I didn't know COVID was going to hit. I don't know about Omicron virus. You don't know the future. But if I could get you to 70 or 80 years old with one dose, I think that's a good a therapy. And if I could give you a second dose and give you another 10 or 15 years and you're 95 years old, man, that's it. No surgery, no open surgery, 95, two doses of radiation, good hearing preservation, good facial nerve. And so that's why I think the cutoff, the conversation is around 45 or 50-ish years old. Radiation becomes a much better option that age or older. But younger than that, I still think surgery. So you know, things at 25 years old, 30 years old, surgery. There, there's radiation is really not an option for them. Surgery is their option. And so uh, that's pretty clear. But in that gray zone, and I don't know, for every surgeon, it's different. Some surgeons will be 40 years old, radiation. Other surgeons, 55 years old. Man, it's okay. I'm, I'm saying in that conversation, 45 to 50-ish, somewhere there's a cutoff where I think radiation is a good option. And then below that, uh, surgery is probably, probably a better option. Hmm, thank you. Uh, I prefer uh, using uh, radio surgery for elderly patients. So yes. now uh, my gray zone uh, is uh, 50, 50 years or yeah. 55 years uh -huh. old. Yeah. Yeah. My gray zone is 45 Maybe to 50. close. Mm. Yeah, for mm. my gray zone is yeah, 45 yeah. to 50. So we're actually close, close. And I think if you got all the surgeons in the, in the world, every country, every continent, their gray zone is gonna be in that area. Because I think yeah. that's where the truth is. You know, when you take all the politics and everything out of it, I think the gray zone, you're right, is around 45, 50, 50, 50, in that area. I think we all, we know in our hearts 
that the true is somewhere in that area. I think that's right. I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, so <laughs> hydrocephalus data is mine, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, hydrocephalus yes. from Japanese is mine. So, And uh, so uh, there is uh, one question from the audience. Sorry. Uh, how easy uh, is it to preserve hearing in intracanalicular acoustic uh, neuroma with uh, radio surgery? Uh, the cochlea is very close. Uh, uh, fundus. Uh, fundus uh, intracanalicular tumor, uh, do you preserve uh, hearing? And this is the uh, question from yeah, the audience. It's, it's very hard to preserve hearing when the tumor is in the lateral canal. It's very close to the cochlea. And so if you follow my data, and you don't have to, it's a, just a gentle suggestion, then I would gently suggest to the patient, if you really want to save hearing, you should probably come for 28 fractions. And then the second question is that, that nobody asked, and, and that's okay, is what's the right number of fractions? And, and that's another five-hour conversation. Like we're going to be here till 2022 talking about one dose, three dose, five dose, 28 doses. That, that's a really long and ugly conversation. But you're right. If the tumor is very lateral in the canal, it's very close to the cochlea, you cannot spare the cochlea. And so those patients may be better for fractionated. I think Dr. Okay. Ajith has a question. Is there any other questions? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, thanks for the excellent talk of uh, balancing <laughs> facial preservation, total excision, and sending patient for radio surgery. And your talk is actually enlightenment what surgeon should do because shrinking the tumor and sending the patient for uh, uh, preserving the remnants of tumor in the critical areas, it's a very good idea. So my question is regarding, you have shown uh, tensor diffusion imaging, tensor diffusion imaging and the relation of uh, facial nerve to the uh, vestibular schwannoma. Uh, can this be helpful in deciding the SRS or gamma knife? and avoid uh, radiation through the nerve or reducing the radiation through the nerve and uh, further problems that occur in the future. Yes, so you're right. So we're using DCI to identify the facial nerve and that's only for surgery to identify it because in surgery, we have to identify it. I do think you could apply it to radiation. I identify it during radiation, but I don't know if it's going to have an impact because you cannot treat the tumor and spare the facial nerve. I mean, we're, we're talking about trying to spare the cochlea and we can't spare the cochlea. So if you can't spare the cochlea, I think sparing the facial nerve will be almost impossible. But what is really remarkable, you know, if you are in the gray zone, if you're in the gray zone, right? <laughs> like, like Professor Kono and I were talking about, the facial nerve is remarkably robust. That's what the data shows that you could treat the 14 gray, right? Uh, uh, Professor Liu was asking, can you go 14 gray with no hearing? You could. And the, the facial nerve is okay. It's robust. And so uh, even if you could identify it, I don't think you're going to spare it. I don't think it's going to make a clinical outcome because the facial nerve is more robust than hearing nerve. And thank goodness, because in surgery, I need the facial nerve to be very robust in surgery. And it's extremely robust for radiation. Uh, but I, I think uh, for us, our facial nerve preservation rate is almost 100% um, uh, ju just at UCLA. And so I, that's a very hard number to beat. So if your facial nerve preservation is all that matters, and Dr. You know, Professor Kono and I were talking about the gray zone, if you're 44, if I'm just outside of Professor Kono's gray zone, I go see him as a patient, I'm 49 years old and 300 days. And he goes, but you're 50 years old, Dr. Yang. Yeah, uh, you must get surgery. I said, no, Professor Kona, I don't want surgery. <laughs> I want radiation because I want to smile. Uh, and so I think the facial nerve is very robust. And I don't think identifying the facial nerve will change our radiosurgical plans. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I learned uh, much from you uh, in this lecture. Thank you, uh, Professor Yang. Thank so, you. It was, it was a pleasure uh, so, talking to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Liu. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, any, any comment, uh, Raja, Prof. Raja? 
Nothing, just the, we have an update from Dr. Shubin. More than 900 people have joined us live on different channels and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for adding this on WeChat channel. And also would like to thank both the speakers, Professor Deng Jiangping and Professor Isaac Yang and the chairs, Professor Shubin and Professor Kono for joining us today. You may continue. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you uh, as, as usual and hope to meet again uh, next Wednesday on 8th of December. Thank you very much.